Torhouse. An arch and a tower. Robinson Jeffers began his first solo building project soon after Tor House was completed. This consisted of a courtyard wall and a detached garage for Yuna's Model T Ford. The garage features an impressive round arch. One story recalls how, soon after completing the garage, Jeffers took to reading about arches, patting himself on the back, perhaps, and if so, rightly so. His reading soon broached the subject of buttresses. The garage was initially a detached self-supporting structure, and it had no buttresses to counter the outward forces produced by the poet's heavy arch. As soon as Jeffers realized the shortcoming, he immediately built twin buttresses for the arch, this one against the west wall of the garage. The wall became an interior wall ten years later, when the dining hall was completed. The garage was converted to a kitchen in 1954 by Robin and Eunice's son Donnan. This work involved the introduction of electric wiring and fixtures, plumbing, sinks, a fireplace, and a bay window with a door. The conversion also called for a doorway to be cut through the west wall of the garage into the dining hall. The heavy labor of breaking through the stone and mortar with a jackhammer was never completed, as evidenced by the undersized doorway. Tragically, one of the laborers died from a heart attack upon returning home from the job. Yuna had a dream of building a tower, so she asked Robin to build her one. It was well understood that Yuna proposed the project to give Robin a therapeutic activity. Soon after he completed the garage, Robin began to work on the tower. Here we find the twins up to their usual mischief. Though the tower that Yuna Jeffers originally envisioned resembled an Irish round tower, her husband's actual creation came to resemble something like a ruined church, like the yellow steeple in Trim, County Meath, Ireland. The tower is elaborately designed, yet its broken profile... Twisting lines and bulging stones seem to allude to the ravages of the centuries, and what's more, a rather biological character. The flat archwork above the tower entrance is remarkably deep, resembling the long, narrow underground entrance of a Bronze Age chamber tomb. Jeffers made the bottom level a kind of vault, cold and hard, with a sort of dungeon and an undersized fireplace. This chamber turned out to be for the boys. Jeffers' desk, chair, and a few of his personal effects are kept here for our benefit. He did not write here. He obtained the desk and chair in 1919 when Tor House was completed. They'd been made from wood salvaged from the old mission long before Robin and Yuna purchased them. A Bible box, inherited from Jeffers' father, is employed as a display case for several items. One of the items is a little sign that says, Not at home before 4 p.m. Each day around 4 p.m. it would be turned over. On the flip side it says, Not at home. A stuffed hawk is perched above the desk, as it was when Jeffers was alive. It's commonly known that Jeffers made much use of hawks as symbols in his poetry. For him, the hawk represented a fierce, focused consciousness that he saw as superior to the cavernously solipsistic, incestuous mentality of the human species. But Jeffers' depictions of hawks were not idyllic, for hawks could be wounded, caged, or even crucified in his reflections on human nature. The acquisition of this stuffed hawk was imposed on the poet against his will. Jeffers loved hawks as living beings, and he must have considered a stuffed hawk offensive. But his son Garth bought it with loving intentions. 
Yuna deployed her veto power to overrule her husband's sensitivities, and the hawk remained, and in a rather prominent place. This hawk was not necessarily a curse. It could have served as a dark muse that might have spurred on Jeffers at times. Who can say? A surprise hides behind the chamber's entry door. Closing the door reveals a secret passage that ascends in a helical arc through the thick stone wall of the tower up to the chamber above. The secret stair is narrow, dark, and not for everyone. Those who don't favor such cozy spaces can opt for the exterior stairway. Before entering Yuna's chamber, one might look up to see a sand casting of a unicorn, Yuna's totem, or spirit being. Just as one presses open the secret door on the second level and the light from Yuna's room flows into the passage, one can see barnacles on the granite wall to one's right. Take note of the door as you close it behind you, as it tends to vanish into the paneling. Whereas the lower vault is barren, mostly undecorated and incapable of much warmth, Yuna's room is quite nicely appointed with a well-lighted Oriel alcove, Philippine mahogany paneling, Gothic arches, and a fully functional fireplace. The tower fireplaces are stacked and share the tower chimney. This room was Yuna's retreat, where she would pass her time reading by the fire or playing a melodeon. The melodeon fit nicely in front of the door of the secret passage, and with its cover down it could function as a desk. Above the fireplace we see a little collection, a Buddha, a Celtic cross, etc., under the glass. Books occupied these shelves in Yuna's time. Between the oriel and the secret door, we see a masterful pastel portrait of Robinson Jeffers, dated 1928. Though Yuna's room exhibits some impressive stonework, particularly in its seaward alcove, much of the room is so impaneled that one might momentarily forget that one is encased in granite. Looking seaward through the granite archway, one can detect on the left-hand side more barnacles on the granite. Tor House and Hawk Tower are particularly rich in religious iconography, thanks to Yuna, and a variety of faiths are represented. The small wax doll in the niche on the left is said to have once been the possession of a local Mission Indian. Above the niche is inscribed B.V. de la Torre, that is, Blessed Virgin of the Tower. Robinson Jeffers made Hawk Tower to order for Yuna, but he did not call it Yuna's Tower or Unicorn Tower. He named it Hawk Tower, naming it after his totem and crowning the top doorway with a sand casting of a hawk. He also called the tower, quote, my tower, end quote, in one of his more notable poems. The white marble plaque embedded in the west wall of the turret platform is carved with a Latin inscription that translates into something like this. R.J. made me this hawk tower with his own hands, 1924. The inscription initially indicated the year 1124, a date that nearly seems likely, from the look of the tower. After the quick insertion of an undersized M, however, it has read 1924 ever since. In a sense, Hawk Tower served as three towers. For the boys, it was a fort, a workshop, and a refuge for the imagination. For Yuna, the tower was a warm, cozy, and private getaway to share with music or a book. For Jeffers himself, it was a roofless turret exposed to the elements, a portal to the universe. Every night, the poet invariably climbed to the top of Hawk Tower before bed to watch the stars. The view from the top was better before his trees grew to maturity. 
From there, he could enjoy a good view of Point Lobos, Pebble Beach, and even Carmel Valley. Though the turret was the poet's domain, it was not exclusively so. His twin sons also employed it on occasion. As his son Garth recounts, quote, From somewhere we obtained an outfit of mechanics' overalls and stuffed it with rags. Then we took it to the highest point of the tower and waited for a car containing sightseers to approach. When it was just below the house, we rolled the thing off with ear-splitting screams. Jeffers built the first two levels of Hawk Tower using a ramp to roll stones up the tower. The ramp was supported by, quote, rather a precarious-looking, end quote, scaffold, as Garth Jeffers describes, quote, built of driftwood and used lumber, some from Custer's recently completed house, and some from a small pile in the wild blackberry patch north of the Odell's place, end quote. A couple years into the project, Harry Prager, a resourceful, one-eyed neighbor who had worked on ships and railways in many parts of the world, asked Jeffers if he'd tried using a pulley system to lift stones. Prager then rigged a block-and-tackle system for the tower project. And the poet learned as he labored. It was perhaps while Jeffers was working on his tower's intertwining stairways, or Una's elegant chamber with its gothic arches and gravity-defying oriel, that Jeffers experienced his creative breakthrough as a poet. The road to that breakthrough must have involved years of stone arrangement, selection, rolling, lifting, and fitting, trial and error, and perhaps a strained muscle or three. By 1924, with the tower stonework complete, the poet must have been deeply socialized to stone. It is for this reason that Hawk Tower can be seen as Jeffers Muse, not in any supernatural sense, just common sense. The poet's intense engagement with stone masonry could hardly have failed to affect his character, and as modern neuroscience would have it, even alter his brain physically. Though the poet in Jeffers had been reborn, yet his latest poem collection would be rejected, so he gave up on the publishers and paid to have 450 copies printed, and not having any means of distribution, stored the books in the eaves of the attic of Tor House. It would not be long, however, before the new Jeffers was discovered by three poets collecting material for a California anthology. The book would get its name from one of Jeffers' poems, Continent's End. Next up, Voices in the Granite. Schedule a tour of Tor House at torhouse.org. This independent presentation was produced in support of the Robinson Jeffers Torhouse Foundation. The views expressed herein are not necessarily those of the Foundation. Your support for Torhouse is appreciated.